The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. With that, what I want to do is think about, uh, finish up thinking about modulation. Last time, we thought about modulation in a communications context. That's a very important context. It's a way of thinking about how we can use modulation to, f to better match a signal to, to the medium. So we saw, in particular, that if we were trying to transmit human voice via electromagnetic waves, trying to simply launch an electrical representation of the voice into electromagnetic waves just doesn't work very well. And that's because of the enormous frequency difference. We would rather have frequencies on the order of 2 gigahertz for efficient um, transmission through the, through, through the atmosphere. And human voices just are not centered on 2 gigahertz. So we can use modulation to bridge that gap. Having done that, we're, we get a number of other advantages, too. So for example, we, had, we uh, talked last time about the idea of broadcast radio, which was an enormous revolution. <clears throat> the idea of being able to instantly communicate lots of stuff like a newspaper, but instantaneously, not with a day or a week delay, <clears throat> was an enormous deal. <clears throat> Today, what I want to think about I mean, the, the way we motivated last time, the way to do the modulation that we motivated last time was the idea of amplitude modulation. Amplitude modulation is a terribly nonlinear process, right? We multiply two signals. That's pretty nonlinear, <laughs> okay? And you could imagine that if we're willing to open up that can of worms so that we're willing to do a transformation that is nonlinear, there's enormous numbers of them. So you don't have to just do amplitude modulation. You could also do, uh, here are three classics. You can do phase modulation and frequency modulation as well. All of those systems work. Phase modulation, the idea is, well, first off, amplitude modulation. The idea was you modulate, so this is the carrier. Cos omega CT is the carrier. That's the thing that goes through the medium well. Now we want to somehow embed the message on the carrier. In AM, we did that by multiplying. We take the signal x of t, and we multiply it. We take the signal of interest, x of t, and we multiply it by the carrier <clears throat> and transmit that. And we saw that for reasons of decoding simplicity, we, it was convenient to add a, uh, a constant term, which was essentially sending not only the modulated the carrier, but also the carrier alone, so that you could locally retrieve both the modulated message and the carrier. It simplified demodulation. But a different kind of alternative is convey the message in the phase, right? We all love phase, right? Nod your head, yes. We all love phase. Uh, so what we could do instead is take the carrier and add a phase term in proportion to the message. That's a different way of coding the message on a carrier. <clears throat> Another way to do it is to code the frequency. So, uh, so take the message, integrate it. It's kind of a funny way to, to, to talk about FM. So you could um, use the message to modulate the frequency of the carrier, which would be very similar to using the message to modulate the phase. They, in fact, differ by a, um, an integral. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that more in a minute. So the idea, then, is even though the first thing they tried the, the first successful way of making broadcast radio was via AM, we should think about the alternatives and try to figure out what are the advantages and disadvantages of different kinds of coding schemes. <clears throat> and also, consistent with the goals of this course, in thinking about these alternatives, we're going to get a lot of practice in thinking about Fourier transforms, right? which is good. So uh, let's think about what would be the difference between AM modulation where we convey the message by modulating the amplitude of the carrier versus FM, where we convey the message by modulating the instantaneous frequency of the carrier. And if we just look in a time domain, which is, after all, probably the first place anybody should look, if we just compare those two schemes in the time domain, there's some very big differences, right? 
you can see that when we amplitude modulate, the power that is used to transmit the message depends on the message. Okay, so uh, there are places where there is not much power, there's not much energy in the signal, and there are places where there's lots. By contrast, down here, you see something that has constant power. At least if you integrate over, say you've got a, a two gigahertz um, carrier, then as long as you integrate over 10 or 20 cycles, which is a small fraction of a second, you're going to get the same answer regardless of where in the message you do the integral. Okay? So there's obviously a power difference. There's no need to transmit the carrier in order to decode the FM signal, unless, of course, you're interested in understanding exactly where DC is. The interesting thing about audio is that we're very insensitive to DC, so that's not really very important for conveying uh, speech sounds. <clears throat> but the original motivation for thinking about alternative ways of coding was, in fact, bandwidth. So the idea was uh, there's a limited resource. Bandwidth is a limited resource. If person A is using one megahertz plus or minus five kilohertz, which is one of the broadcast AM frequency bands, then person B can't use that band. <clears throat> okay? You can have only one transmitter for each of the radio bands. That makes bandwidth, radio bandwidth, a resource. Now, there's lots of it. There's lots of frequencies between uh, uh, a megahertz and two gigahertz. On the other hand, there's lots of people who want it. <laughs> Uh, so, your local fire department thinks they ought to be able to talk to each other. Your local police department thinks they ought to be able to talk to each other. Your local ambulance service thinks they ought to be able to talk to each other. So there's lots of people with demands for it. So the idea, uh, uh, the original uh, pursuit of FM was to try to think about a scheme that would use less bandwidth. If you're thinking about speech, you need about three kilohertz. Three kilohertz is considered um, telephone quality speech. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to get very good speech intelligibility across it. <clears throat> so AM used plus or minus five kilohertz bandwidth. They al allocated a band of 10 kilohertz for every station. The idea, the initial idea in FM, to, so take this um, expression for FM and think about an instantaneous frequency, omega i, which is a, is a frequency with a slightly different value from the carrier frequency. It's different because we're doing FM. And you can calculate the instantaneous frequency as the derivative of phase. So the derivative of phase gives you an omega-c term out front. Omega-c-t is the carrier phase. And then there's the part of the phase that comes from the message. So the total instantaneous frequency is omega c plus the time derivative of phase. And since we're modulating frequency, since we're modulating with the frequency, uh, that turns out to be proportional to x. So the instantaneous frequency, like you would like for frequency modulation, the instantaneous frequency is a linear function of the message, x. But it's proportional. So the reasoning was make k small. If the instantaneous deviations of frequency are small, say 10 to the minus 6 hertz, really small, well, if you could have 10 to the minus 6 hertz, you could pack uh, 10 to the 6 stations in a hertz. Well, that's pretty good, right? So instead of using 10 kilohertz to send one message, you could get 10 to the 6 messages in 1 hertz of bandwidth. That was the original motivation. That was an idea that was propagated at Bell Labs, <clears throat> or, where, who were, do, who were um, one of the commercial entities who were seriously interested in trying to make money on broadcast radio. <clears throat> so the idea was maybe we could use FM to squeeze more signals in the available bandwidth. OK, well, that turns out to be completely wrong. And that's why studying Fourier transforms is such a good example of how you can use Fourier transforms to figure things out. <clears throat> that argument is just completely wrong, as two lines of 003 will show you. <clears throat> so 
so here is our expression for the FM signal. You can see that it's complicated because it's the cosine of a sum. But we all know from trigonometry, the cos of A plus B is cos A cos B minus sine A sine B. So we can get an exact expression for, uh, for this part. For, we can expand this exactly as the cosine A times the cosine of B minus the sine of A minus, uh, times the sine of B. OK, well, that's easy. Now, what would happen to that expression if we made k very small? Well, if we make k very small, if k goes close to 0, the cosine gets arbitrarily close to 1. Fine, that sounds OK. The sine of k times something does not go, well, the fallacy in the reasoning was that goes to 0. It does go to 0, but it actually goes to 0 slowly. It actually, the limit approaches k times. So the limit of, of the sine of theta as theta gets small is theta. OK, so the idea wasn't quite right. It doesn't go arbitrarily close to 0. It gets, gets arbitrarily close to the message. So that means that this expression, which looks horrible up here, is equivalent to this expression, which says that the signal that I'm transmitting is the carrier, just like AM, minus sine omega CT times the message. But that's just AM. I took the message times sine. Ah, it's sine, it's not cosine, who cares? Right? That's a difference of 90 degrees of phase, who cares? It's AM. The fallacy in the reasoning is that this k does not, the, the sine of theta, when theta gets small, does not go to zero, it goes to theta. And so the limiting case for narrow band FM has precisely the same bandwidth as AM. Narrow band FM has the same bandwidth as AM. So therefore, this whole idea that you could use FM to squeeze more channels into a given bandwidth is just completely wrong. So it was the initial motivation. It's just wrong. <clears throat> In fact, what's good about FM is the other limit. Don't worry about narrow band. Worry about broadband. The value of FM, and this was uh, Armstrong again, the same guy who did the super heterodyne uh, receiver, which made AM broadcast radio possible. Same guy went on to think about FM. And he saw that the value of FM was, in fact, to use lots of bandwidth. Why would you do that? Well, we'll see in a minute that the reason you want to use a lot of bandwidth is that you generate a robust signal that can be recovered even when noise gets added to it. <clears throat> One of the big problems, especially with the early versions of AM broadcast radio, was that it had a lot of noise in the background we called static. Kind of like tss, but a little bit more poppy and more irritating. <clears throat> and, and Armstrong figured out that there was a way to reduce that static by using more bandwidth to make a more robust signal. So that's the idea. And Coincidentally, it gives us an excellent opportunity to practice our skills of figuring out Fourier transforms. So let's figure out the Fourier transform of an FM signal. Right? That'll be fun. So uh, remember what the FM signal looks like, right? We, we saw back here, it's kind of horrendous looking. So the goal for the next five minutes is to take the Fourier transform of that. So. Uh, Let's think, about find, let's think about phase coding. Phase and frequency coding are almost the same thing. All you do is, in one case, you transmit a phase in proportion to x. That's phase modulation. In the case of frequency modulation, you transmit a phase proportional to the integral of x, which is the same as modulating the instantaneous frequency by x. OK. So let's think about phase modulating by sine omega mt. So uh, this is omega carrier and omega message. <clears throat> and I'm putting an m out front, the modulation depth, just so that I can track what happens as I turn up the signal, turn up the amplitude of the signal. 
So let's think about what does the signal look like. Um, so we have um, cos A plus B. We expand that as cos A cos B minus sine A sine B. And let's start by looking at this first term, which is modulated something. OK, the something is the hard part. So the something is the cosine of m sine omega mt, for the particular case that the message is the sine omega mt. OK, so let's think about that. So we'll start with the message, sine omega mt, and we'll say that it, the modulation depth is 1. Now we have to take the cosine of that. Uh, so now we take the cosine of this signal. OK, so this signal is going 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. So the cosine of that, when the sine is 0, the cosine is 1. Then the sine is going toward 1. Well, as the sine goes toward 1, the cosine starts going down, right? The, the first part of the cosine wave, uh, cosine t, as you increase t from 0, it starts to decay. Same thing's happening here. But then, by the time the sine gets up to 1, the sine starts going down, so the cosine starts going back up. Everybody see what I'm plotting? So this waveform is a sine waveform, and this is the cosine of that waveform. <clears throat> That's what an FM signal is. Okay. Now, as I increase the modulation depth, so make the modulation depth now 2, now the deviation from 1 is bigger. Right Before, the deviation from 1 was caused when the sine wave went up to 1. Now the biggest deviation occurs when the sine wave gets up to 2. It's bigger. And then I make it bigger and bigger. OK, by the time, I, what was the, so the big difference between 3 and 4, 3 and 4, why is the big difference between 3 and 4? It's because there's a number between 3 and 4. Pi, <laughs> OK? So by the time you get to pi, it rolls over. Everybody see that? So, so I started out uh, 1, 2, 3, just less than pi, 4, just bigger than pi, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20, 50, horrendous, right? But I want you to find the Fourier transform of that. Actually, I want you to find the Fourier transform of that. But as a subtopic, I'll accept the Fourier transform of that. OK, look at your neighbor. Tell me the Fourier transform of that.
OK, so what's the Fourier transform of the bottom thing? OK, that was a hard question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> nice. It was number four. Got it. <laughs> uh, so what's the, how do I, what should I notice about this signal? Step one. As a sophisticated signal processor at this point, after all, it's the penultimate lecture. You're already sophisticated. So as a sophisticated signal processor, what do you notice immediately about that waveform? It just cries out at you, and it says, Periodic, exactly. Even though it's horrendous, it's periodic. Why is that interesting? It has a series, precisely. So all I need to do to figure out the transform is figure out the series. OK, so let's do that. So now let's start. So same waveform on the top, m equals 1, just like before. Now I'm going to take the series of this periodic waveform. And I'm going to represent that down here. As you see, as I start to modulate this waveform, I'm getting two bumps where I had one bump of this, where I had one period of this. I'm getting two periods here. OK? So, so that's the reason my first non zero contribution is k equals 2. Also, notice that if I turned m the whole way down to 0, I would just get dc, k equals 1. So for these, small k, for these small m's, I'm mostly getting dc and k equals 2. Okay. Now as I turn up the amplitude, now I'm getting something that doesn't look quite as much like a sine wave. And that distortion is manifest as some k equals 4. Then I turn it up higher. Whoops, I hit the button a few times more than I intended to. If I go up to m equals 5, now it's wrapped around like this. And I can see I've got k equals 0, 2, 4, 6, and a little 8. Keep going up, 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 up. And what, what you can see is that as I turn up the amplitude, I'm getting bigger and bigger k's. In fact, there's kind of a simple relationship. By the time I got up to m equals 50, I got about 50 k's, roughly speaking. And that has something to do with the periodicity of the cosine being 6, 2 pi. Okay? So the number of terms I'm getting is related to how big that signal is. OK, so I was able to represent this horrendous signal now by a series. But I asked you for what I'm really trying to do is find the transform of this. We just found the series of this. But I really want to find the transform of that. So I'd like to turn this into a transform. How do I turn a series into a transform? To turn each k into an impulse. Wait, so now I get a train of impulses. Each one of them has weights uh, proportional to the length of the lines, right? Then each impulse gets located in frequency instead of in k space. Each, each impulse gets located in frequency at a multiple of 2 pi over omega m. OK? So when I do that, I get the transform of this mass, which looks like this centered here. But then I modulate by the cosine. So modulation gives me two copies. I get the whole spectrum for the inside here and a duplicate over there, and this time centered on omega c. OK? That's, that's all perfectly clear, right? So then uh, I just did this term. Now I have to worry about that term, but it's the same thing. Except now my periodicity is a little different. Now I'm taking the sine of the sine rather than the cos of the sine. So now uh, as I crank up the waveforms, the, the picture looks slightly different. The uh, principal harmonics are now odd because of the odd symmetry of the sine wave. So I had evens when I used cosine. I have odds when I use sine. So now I'm filling in a bunch of odd harmonics. But the general pattern looks very similar. 
so that now the result looks very similar to the result from before, and the sum is the sum. So here's the Fourier transform of uh, this waveform, y of t. The point is, it's huge bandwidth. The advantage of FM is not uh, in conserving bandwidth, it's actually using bandwidth. So we're using, this is the k big case, so we're doing wideband FM. We're, show, we're shoving frequency components all over the spectrum. But the advantage of that is that I get a signal that's very robust. Imagine if I were to add a small level of noise to this signal, you could still recover the signal. The only thing that's coded here is one sine wave that has one period across that whole length. You could recover that in the absence of not only a little noise, but an enormous amount of noise. And that was what FM was good for. And that's what Armstrong figured out, and that's why we have FM. And that's why uh, television, uh, even HDTV, uses FM coding of the audio, okay? Because it's resilient to noise. <clears throat> okay, so that was kind of a motivation for thinking about modulation in terms of communications. I don't want you to go away thinking about, the, uh, thinking about modulation as only useful for communications. So I want to close with a kind of unconventional use of modulation. I may have mentioned that I like microscopy. <laughs> so I'm going to show you how you can use modulation to improve microscopy. So this was an idea of Michael Mermelstein. Michael was a PhD student in my lab. He thought of it. Uh, Stan and Jay developed it. They all three got PhDs on this topic. Bertolt is a professor in CS. And the five of us worked on this project. <clears throat> so the idea is improving microscopy uh, with 6003, and with, micro, with uh, modulation in particular. <clears throat> so you've all seen this. This is the 003 model of a microscope. 003 mi microscope convolved with blurring function. Done. Okay, that's what a microscope is. <clears throat> that's the 003 model of a microscope. Microscope is a low-pass filter because all of the different spatial frequencies that are available in the target can't get through all the lenses for very fundamental reasons in physics. The high frequencies don't make it, the low frequencies do. The result is a blurred image. So I'm representing this as the target. It passes through the microscope, which is represented by a low-pass filter, and it comes out a blurry picture. <clears throat> Okay, Michael's idea was instead of illuminating the target with uniform light, if you tear apart a microscope, a lot of the guts are intended to make a nice uniform light that goes across the target, a nice uniform illumination. Michael's idea was let's not do that, let's project stripes on it. Okay, that's a little bizarre. <laughs> So instead of having a nice blurry picture of a target, Michael wanted me to generate blurry pictures of stripey targets. Okay, but you're a sophisticated 003 people, as was Michael. Why does he want to do that? Different frequency. What's so, up? Phase modulated microscopy. That's why he wants to do this, right? We're going to modulate microscopy. Okay, well, what's that? Okay, so Stan Hong was, uh, was uh, one of our TAs in 003, and he wanted to explain the way this works using purely 003 terms. He also knew that I would be receptive to that and that Bertolt Horan, who teaches this course all the time, would be receptive to that kind of an argument. So Stan made a picture to illustrate that. <clears throat> So here's Stan's picture. What do you see? Nice picture, right? <laughs> what do you see? Gray. Excellent. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Some of you closer to the front, what do you see? Stripes. 
So what you see is stripes. And if I were sitting where you're sitting, I wouldn't see the stripes. Why is that? Because my eyes, like any optical system, blurs. Me being old, they blur more than you being young. <laughs> you can see stripes better than I can. So if I were to sit there, or if, I were to, or if you were to sit in the back row, it would be hard to see the stripes, but you'd still see blur. You'd still see gray. Okay? So what do I do? OK, this is 003. We just did phase modulated microscopy. What should I do next? I have a stripy picture. How did the picture get stripy? It got modulated. So what should I do next? Demodulate it. So how do we do that? Do the same process when, the, and that process was. So I put stripes. I illuminated the picture with stripes in order to make the original. So now what I should do is illuminate the result with stripes. Okay. If I multiply the picture by stripes, I'm phase modulating it. Okay multiply by cos omega whatever, right? So now I'll put the clicker down, okay? No cheating, right? Nothing, nothing up my sleeves. And now I'm going to project that stripey pattern. <laughs> Cute, huh? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> so who is that? Fourier, good. <laughs> okay, so that's the principle behind Michael's microscope. <clears throat> okay, and by the way, I'm not cheating. Um, so if I roll the phase, right? So it, it works just like radio. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now, how's it work? And how well, so that was a demo. Um, uh, Stan's committee loved it. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's the idea. So the poster was phase modulated Fourier. Fourier is a function of x and y. <laughs> and you modulate the phase of a carrier. The carrier now is the y displacement because we were putting this kind of line on it. So we modulated carrier, cos omega cy was the carrier, by the phase of Fourier. <clears throat> so we bumped the lines up and down, we being Stan. <laughs> Stan bumped the lines up and down in proportion to the brightness of Fourier. And that put Fourier's content centered on omega c. So it was hard to see from the audience because your eyes so uh, the, uh, the projector projected omega c. It's hard for you to see from the audience because your visible frequencies in space don't go that high. But you beat it with the stripey pattern that modulates in space just the way it modulates in time. And it takes a copy of Fourier, which had been modulated up to omega c, and bumps it back down to the visible. That's why you can see it. Well, we're going to see that in a moment. What a good question. <laughs> so uh, the idea is precisely the same as the superheterodyne radio. If this is the complicated picture that we would like to look at, this is the Fourier transform or the complicated picture that we would like to look at, if we demodulate with this stripe at omega c, we were able to bounce down this uh, uh, peaky house, and we're able to see that part of the picture even though those frequencies are too high for them to go through the microscope. There's a limited number of frequencies that will go through the microscope, just like there's a limited number of frequencies that will go through your eye. And we can take a band of frequencies that don't make it through the microscope, beat it with this stripey pattern into a frequency range that does go through the microscope. <clears throat> then we can change the stripey pattern. 
if we make stripey pattern with slightly higher frequency, we get a different part of the invisible spectrum, and we just keep repeating. There's a bit of an issue that it's a 2D transform, so we have to worry about frequencies in X and frequencies in Y. But we're all experts at this sort of thing. The difference between stripes this way and stripes this way is Fourier's this way and Fourier's that way, right? You rotate the stripe, it just rotates the Fourier transform, right? So um, we can think about in space, we can uh, modulate like that, or we can modulate like that. And in fact, what we would like to do is modulate by a whole bunch <clears throat> so that we could take all these little regions. So say the circle corresponds to the uh, radius of frequencies that get through the optical microscope. What we'd like to do is put that little radius at every possible place, one at a time, to, to bring down those frequencies in the target one at a time. <clears throat> So then, so the idea is, so then the, the problem becomes, how do you make so many stripey patterns? And you have to generate those stripey patterns at very high spatial frequencies, very small distances. <clears throat> if you're gonna beat a microscope, <clears throat> microscope resolution, optical microscope resolutions are on the order of 500 nanometers, <clears throat> wavelength of light. So you're gonna have to make these patterns small compared to the wavelength of light. So Michael's idea was interference. You take two coherent laser beams, point them toward each other, but at a slight angle, and they will interfere and make a stripey pattern. Then you turn on a different pair of beams, and you get a different stripey pattern. Different, different, different. I'm showing on the left the spatial, and on the right the Fourier transform. Fourier transform, for the stripey pattern, all light, all pictures have some DC because there's no negative photons. So that's this, and these are coding uh, the, uh, the angle is coding the orientation, and the distance is coding the pitch. Different stripey pattern, different, different, different. There's a bunch of them. So with 15 beams, you get 15 take two, right? Order 15 squared, okay? That's the idea. Um, and that was Michael. This is Stan. Stan figured out a way to build an apparatus to take the beam from a laser, break it into 15 parts, steer it with a bunch of mirrors, and point them all toward the center. So the target, so the laser's coming in over here, there's these pick-off mirrors that's steering things around. This was some complicated optimization that Stan did. Uh, so here's the uh, region of interest, which is this big on his microscope. <clears throat> and uh, about two centimeters down, the beams converge on a specimen, which is right there. <clears throat> so if we zoom in and you can see it a little bit better, there's a conventional microscope objective with 15 beams fired toward it. So now the idea is you put the specimen between the beams and the objective, and then you view the stripey illuminated target with the microscope objective. <clears throat> Here is a picture taken by Jay where, where he took a bunch of small beads. It's easy to get uh, plastic beads of very uniform dimension. So these are about one micron beads, <clears throat> and a gazillion of them. So he just took, made a solution of beads, put them on a glass slide, evaporated it, <clears throat> so that he would have a, a random constellation of plastic beads, all one micron in diameter. And here's one picture of it, and you can see the pixels, right? Uh, each one of these squares is one pixel in the camera. I'm zooming in a lot. <clears throat> Keep in mind that these guys are only about a micron in dimension. But then if you change the stripey pattern, you get a slightly different picture. <laughs> and if you change the stripey pattern again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So he recorded then 300 and some odd pictures 
of the same thing with different stripey patterns. Then he did some signal processing and turned that sequence of pictures into that picture. So you can see the resolution's up a bit. The resolution is very sub-pixel. You can see many resolution elements inside one pixel from the original picture. <clears throat> In fact, if you, take, if you compare the original to the reconstruction, so this is one picture taken uh, with uniform illumination. This is uh, the result of calculating some 300 pictures with structured illumination, with different structure in each picture. And you can see a lot better resolution here. In fact, you can see here, there's something that looks like it might be a bead. But over here, you can see more clearly it's really two beads. <clears throat> and if you take a solitary bead and plot the brightness through a line, you get this. But if you plot the brightness through a reconstruction, you get something much um, narrower. <clears throat> Stan then uh, developed a method for scanning uh, this around. He also uh, developed a method for measuring the point spread function directly. So here I'm gonna show you a measurement, same sort of apparatus, with a 200 nanometer bead, a much smaller bead. <clears throat> Keep in mind that the apparent brightness goes as the cube of diameter. So changing the diameter by a factor of five changed the apparent brightness by five cubed. <clears throat> So here's a picture taken with Stan's microscope. <clears throat> and uh, if we take a row of pixels and plot the brightness, this is the reconstructed image by using standing wave illumination, which is what we called it. Uh, and it's got an apparent diameter of 290. The 290 is bigger than the 200 because of the blurring of the microscope, okay? The prediction based on the angle of the laser beams the resolution of this microscope depends on the angle of the laser beams because the angle of the laser beams determines the pitch of the fringe, the, the pitch of the stripey pattern. <clears throat> Predict, so the prediction based on the angle, the, the angle of the beams from the apparatus was that it should have been 250. And the fair thing to compare that to is what would it have been if we hadn't used standing wave illumination if we hadn't used standing illumination, it would have been 1,500 nanometers. <clears throat> so you can see there's an enormous increase in the resolution by using this phase-modulated microscopy. So the point is that you can use modulation for a lot other things than communication. So the application in communications is terribly important, but here was a completely different application of modulation to improve microscopy. Okay? Thank you. See you next time. Fill out the uh, subject evaluation.